And I've listened to what, obviously, everything you've done so far, many times over. And what I have uh, come to the conclusion is an audio book gives a book a third dimension. Wow. Oh, well, thanks for that. Um, no, well, it, no, it does. Um, and as the author, I can sit there and listen to things, and I think class is really, really good. And I really enjoy listening to it. Dr. Tony Miller, welcome. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good to speak to you. Now, although we've worked together, uh, this is the first time we've actually had a conversation. This is the first time we've virtually met. So it is nice to see you. Um, fabulous audio book. We're actually, you and I are working on the second one in the series of six. But the first right. one is on sale right now. It's called Cut, C-U-T-T, -T, a remarkable story from Afghanistan. Hell had been released. The helicopter explosion was massive. The mortars had been set to the furthest point of the camp. The girls were loading them like professionals. One of the team was adjusting the range, bringing it in closer by 25 metres each time. The RPGs were brilliant. The whole camp seemed a sea of fire. So what is your day job? Uh, well, I'm a psychologist. I go around the uh, world giving lectures. Uh, not so much on psychology, but on how businesses can improve productivity. So I get, I'm traveling all the time in normal times. Yeah. Uh, now I'm sort of desk bound because of COVID-19. But uh, give you some feel for that. In the last nine years, I've been to about 37 different countries. Wow. So you're quite the sought after speaker. Yes, quite a traveler. Yeah. So... Is it your travels that inspired the, the books? Well, I've done, a lot, I've done a lot of work, let's say, in the Middle East and in that area. So I've got a very, very good idea about sort of what goes on. So the inspiration really was I dreamt about it one night and I thought I ought to write a book on this. And the other, the other curious thing, and try not to laugh when I tell you this, all of my... Um, uh, fiction books, if you want to call them that, are written when I'm asleep. Isn't that curious? So is this the same thing, like the, the famous story that I know, is that Paul McCartney says he woke up with the tune to Yesterday. Is it, yeah, a, I, is it I, a similar I, I thing that, to that? I'm still a bit more organised, I think, in as much as I will go to bed thinking about a chapter or a scenario and I can actually make myself dream it. And if I don't like it, I can go back to sleep and redream it. So uh, it's all it's all written when I'm asleep. People, because people say you must be a prolific writer, because I've written twenty six books and God knows how many white papers, and most of it I should do when I'm asleep, <laughs> which well, isn't a reflect. It's not a reflection on the quality. <laughs> no, but that is quite incredible. And how do you do? You have a system for remembering your dreams then. I don't forget them. I'm I'm pretty good for about a week, so I need to really write it up in a week. But they're bits of chapters. So I have the, the total uh, framework in my mind for the chapter. I mean, the, the piece I'm writing for book 27 at the moment is, um, is very complicated. There's a battle scene in it, and it's really, really very, very complicated. And I'm, I've, can't really i've been trying to get to grips with the distances between the various locations because i like to be very precise and that's how they get put together but precision can get you into a huge amount of trouble uh when i was writing the book uh, my love affair with olga that series i uh, made a big mistake i asked on facebook if somebody could tell me the exact distance between two towns in siberia and how long it would take to travel in there in the winter when it was snowing. And a guy wrote up and he actually lived in the town, the town I was writing about, he lived there. And he gave me all of this data, which I was so pleased with. Then I had some nutcase uh, who accused me of being an American spy. Well, I pointed out I'm not an American, but that didn't, uh, <laughs> that didn't go down too well at all. And in the end, we had to get him blocked off of Facebook. It just would not stop. Wow, so it was. <laughs> Right. So 
Well, it's look, you're lucky then that he didn't get the FBI involved or the CIA. Uh, well, 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 what I did, I sent all of the books, there were five in that series, I sent them all to the Russian embassy here in the UK and also to, uh, I can never remember what they're called. The, um, the, uh, the KGB aren't called the KGB anymore. They have another title, but it's their equivalent. I just sent a whole lot of books for them uh, with a covering letter that this is all a fictional story although it does seem like it's true. <laughs> wow. You also, now you said that you say these are the fiction books. Yeah. But you also, you write nonfiction in your capacity, I'm guessing, as a as a management consultant and, yeah, and sure. psychologist. Yeah, sure. So yeah. and do you, you dream them as well? No, 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 no. They're, they are truly hard work because what you're doing is you're, you're putting a lot of research material together and practical experiences. And you're actually giving businesses best professional advice. So it's got to be absolutely spot on. And I, for whatever reason, I can't dream it. OK, well, yeah. As a psychologist, I have no idea why, Graham. So don't, don't ask me why. I have no idea. As a psychologist, tell you about yourself then, that you dream these fictional stories. Yeah. Is, does it, is, am I right in saying that they haven't worked out? We don't know why we dream at the moment. Is that No, true? nobody has any idea at all. Um, it, the only thing is in your um, your subconscious, you have an, a massive database of information. And if you can tap into that when you're asleep, then, you know, your dreams will actually produce the results. And I had a friend, friend of mine uh, who's got a quite a big business and he had a, an issue to sort out. I said, well, think about it just before you go to sleep. And you've really got to think about it. And I said, you'll probably have a solution in the morning. And he was absolutely amazed. Oh, Eureka, it worked. Well, it's not that surprising, really, because all the information's in your mind. You've just got to get it sorted out and in some sort of order. And how better to do it when you're asleep? Because you've got absolutely no distractions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can just delve deep and can go as deep as you like and, and yeah, it can pull out yeah. everything out of that huge yeah. database. Wow. And yeah. what are the white papers you've worked on then? Oh, they're all on uh, topical things like at the moment, um, the big issue is probably homeworking. Right. And you, we're, we're going to see about 30% of most people working at home. Well, if they do, you would pay them less. So everybody thinks, oh, homeworking's great. I'll be able to sit at home and get the same salary. It's not going to be like that at all. Wow. It will be, they'll be earning a lot less. Well, that, that hits home for me because I now work from, this is my wardrobe. And yeah. this is where I record yeah. the audiobooks because yeah. pre-COVID I, uh, I worked in radio. And yeah. uh, uh, after COVID, um, this is where I ended up. Right. So will there, will there be a, an answer then to, to getting the salaries back up there? Mind no, you, that, you've got less expense. I used to spend, it was, I can't remember what the season ticket into London used to cost. It's only a 40 minute train ride, but it was a, it was a chunk of change and well, I don't precisely. miss it. Precisely. Yeah. So you'll be paid less because you won't have that expense, will you? Yeah, I'm not spending anything. You know, I'm not buying coffee from a coffee shop or everything. I'm yeah, just going yeah, into the yeah. kitchen and yeah. stuff. Well, it's, it's got it's got uh, fours and against. I think from a, yeah, my my view is always from a business point of view. From a business point of view, you'll be paying twenty five to thirty percent of the staff a lot less money to do their jobs, and there's also going to be a glut, a huge huge glut of people on the labour market because businesses have realised during COVID nineteen there's absolutely no need to have so many people. And <laughs> the horror story is people are the weakest link. So if you look at organizations that are highly automated, like Foxconn in China, um, your, your, uh, Amazon, Amazon is a prime example. Amazon employ 300,000 robots. Wow. At least. Wow. So how do they keep on working during COVID-19? Well, their robots don't go sick, do they? There isn't, there isn't a COVID-20 for robots. Yeah, yeah. That would, be, um, that would actually be a good book, wouldn't it? A, a book about a pandemic that affects robots. <laughs> you know, because that would bring the world to a standstill and we'd be looking yeah. for a cure and a, some kind of yeah. digital sure. vaccination or something. Yeah. Sure, yeah, sure. So excited. We're in exciting times, but things will never, ever, ever go back to how they were. And I don't think the world will ever have 
full employment again. It's just not going to happen. Really? And the, when uh... you, that, you see, you've got artificial intelligence coming along. Yeah. So artificial intelligence can do everything that a human can do, but do it better. Yeah, yeah. And my hairdresser said that. He said, oh, you know, <laughs> you, couldn't get, you couldn't get a robot to do what I'm doing. And I thought, oh, yes, you could, my friend. And I don't have to listen to all your chatter. And, of course, with COVID-19, I don't have to worry about getting a haircut. I'll get the robot to do it. Yeah, yeah. Driverless vehicles would be another one, the amount of stuff that's driven. Yeah. Well, they've been running driverless vehicles in America for, off the record for about five years. Wow. And I'm not talking about just cars. I'm talking about big semi-trucks. Wow. And they've been wow. running up and down the, uh, the west coast of America for quite some time. So did your interest in that kind of thing and, and robots and the changing world, did that inspire the robots that are featured in the books? No. Really? So where did that come from? Because what what time period are they set in? I mean, I've, I've read now. that. It's all, it's it's right all now. now. So it's all the right technology yeah. that you talk about is all technology that, that yeah. could exist if the military when you, wanted When to. you're recording faster yes. and you get up to book six. <laughs> yes. You know, we're in a we're in a, a restaurant in London, um, sitting spaced out, and then we're told that it's going to shut. Which we're it's all right now. Uh, for the robot issue, it's very very interesting. The American Army have got fighting robots. You know, they're, I mean, they you can see them on YouTube. They're they're actually like you and me, but skeletal, and you can't knock them over and you can't stop them. Yeah, apart from blowing them up, you can't actually stop them. They've got drones now, which are self-centering drones. Put out a pack of drones. They have a profile of what the enemy looks like. The drones just fly into people and kill them. That's wow. all available right now. The American Air Force have got fighter planes now, which are completely run by AI. There is no pilot, and there is no little boy sitting there with a joystick controlling it. There, Once they take off, they're entirely on their own. Wow, wow. So just just being aware that that's out there is what brought the robots yeah. into the story. Now, the, yeah. the, the star of the story for me is obviously the commander, who is, <laughs> I mean, he's like superhuman. He, no, he's not. No, he's not. He's no, a regular but, guy. Uh, yeah, a regular guy. <laughs> a regular guy who's just amazing with knives and just... Yeah. But uh, you've got to bear in mind, uh, Graham, uh, this guy trains seven days a week, 13 to 15 hours a day, and he loves what he's doing. Yeah. Now, if yeah. you put that sort of effort in, you'd be quite good at it, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, but he is good. And you, you start in the first book of, of how he, he grew up and uh, he was it was outdoors. He was tending yeah. sheep. He was alone a lot of the time. And he just uh, he just became this this fighting machine. He's yeah, great. yeah. yeah. He, the thing is, he enjoys doing it. He does. He loves so it. He, he's got a career where he's got a job which he really likes, which is killing. He's a he's a walking killing machine. But and he's he also likes, sorry. Yeah, and he likes it. But he's he also a, and he likes it. He, he's also a great leader. The way he motivates the team and the way he he recognizes when they've done well and. Uh, the way they celebrate in the in the way that they do, and he gives them a bit of space because they're culturally they're from Afghanistan, so he gives them their, you know, when they have their birthdays and whatever they get on and do their thing. He is a great leader. Does any of that come from your work working with businesses, uh, to looking at leadership? Yeah, of course. Does it? Of course. Yeah. I mean, what if you look at how most armies work now? Really, really efficient units within the army. Leadership is so, so different to how it used to be, you know, a few years ago. And what the commander is very, very good at doing is telling people what he needs to be done and leaving the team to work out how to do it. And if they make a mistake, he doesn't actually go out of his way to point it out. Very, very good. And throughout the books, there's been some accidents which have nearly always involved him through <laughs> mistakes that the team have made. But he doesn't really sort of go out of his way to uh, to make people feel small because they've done it. No, and he not just, at all. It's an accident. Yeah, you know, just don't do it again. Yeah, There's I a think... bit there he gets one. He gets his ear lopped off by a Himiko. She oh, really? Said, oh you're, now you're spoiling it for me. 
Is that no. you've got something? You're going to get it. You're going to get it. You're going to get it. And it, she actually slices the top of his ear off with a sword. And uh, he doesn't say anything about it at all. Not a word. He realises it was an accident. He realises she didn't mean to do it. And he just let it go. But she realises she's made a big mistake. And I think that's the the issue. And none of the, none of the team want to make mistakes. And they're all trying. They've all got something to prove, really. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And anything yeah. that will make them better, they're on it very, very quickly. Yeah. I think this quote comes from Napoleon. It was, it was some great leader. I think it was Napoleon. And he said, leadership, to be a leader, you have to define reality and give hope. And I think that's what the commander does all the way through. He basically says, he doesn't say this is going to be easy. He says this is going to be tough. And yeah. then, then sometimes they have to train and learn extra skills or get better at certain skills before they can then go in to the mission that they're sent on. Yeah. And, uh, and so do you dream up all the missions as well? Yeah. Wow. And, and who, who are the books aimed at? Well, that's a very, very good question. Um, the books really will be, they're, they're, they're good for men. I really hoped when I wrote them that they would have a very strong um, female following. Because, I mean, it's a really big thing about how good the girls are. It really yeah. is about the girls. Yeah. I know you said the commander's the star of the show, but, you know, I... If I had to put my money on one person, the person I admire the most is Teller. Yeah, because she's uh, only young. Yeah. Well, she's the youngest. She's 14, yeah. Yeah, and she's just stunningly amazing. And, you know, she, she gives a talk at some time, and she actually says, you know, what do you see when you see me? And, yeah, they say, well, you know, you're the youngest in the platoon. She said, that's very interesting, isn't it? And she turns to the platoon and says, what do you see when you see me? And somebody said, well, you're the best with minds, you're the best at doing this, you're very good at that, fearless in battle. Completely different perception Yeah. of yeah. somebody who's 14 years of age. Yeah, from the team, because they're all relying on each other. Yeah. yeah. And to so know I each think, other's I strengths. Think women, I think it's a very an inspirational um, set of books, really. You mentioned Teller. Can it's we talk about some about... of the can we talk Sorry. about some of the other characters? How about Murphy? Where does she come from? <laughs> Poor old Murphy. Murphy. Murphy has the most awful, awful existence, really, in some respects. She's fallen in love with a commander, uh, and that's good. But there are also, you know, a number of other girls who will tell her that they love the commander. And so she's always got this pack of girls, like wolves, sitting behind her, who are all after the commander, really. And uh, I'm, a Begum in particular, I'm sure... It's gone through her mind that if Murphy wasn't there, the commander's mine. Yeah, because she, does, she likes Murphy's spending the evening with him. Yeah, yeah my, Murphy's ex-army, quite a toughie, really. Mm. And um, she has worked endlessly to get these girls as a fighting unit. And she really, really has, has done a, a, a sterling job. You know, really, really sterling. But she's very, very English uh, and very, very... I mean, if you've met many women who are particularly at Sandhurst, Murphy is sort of like the best of the best of those, really. Mm. Real, full of grit. Very, very beautiful. Really, mm. very beautiful woman. Mm. And, of course, her and the commander have uh, become lovers. Mm. But they're, they're very, very discreet about it. You know, they're always creeping off into the bushes so late at night so nobody knows yeah. what's no. Or if they're on the trip to Japan, it was the the first order of business was their night together, but it was away from the others. It was yeah. yeah. So it's always uh, yeah. yeah. And that, that that's a that's a difficult position because the mark commander loves the platoon in terms of he enjoys being with them and he feels responsible for them. So he doesn't really want to be away from them, and it's very much the same for Murphy. So for the commander and Murphy to have any have any naughtiness they've really got to try and get away from the platoon and the platoon don't want them to be away from them so quite often they've been in the bushes and the platoon all turn up and wonder what they're doing you know? <laughs> uh, they, they just and that's that, that's been a stressful thing for the commander i think it's more of a man's thing than a woman's thing that that he just can't seem to have sex with murphy without 
half the platoon bumping into it. You know. <laughs> now, there was a character in the first book, and I, because and I, I don't want to uh, spoil this, and unless you're happy to talk, to, so I don't want to give too much away. But there was a character no, in the fir first book who I was really disappointed when they got killed. But then you creatively managed to bring them back in the second book. Well, this is Cher. Yes. Now, did you make the decision? Did you know she was coming back when you killed her? Or did you go, you know what? This story needs her back and you brought her back. No, no I, knew, I, I knew I could bring her back. She, she's been created by... Um, uh, an artificial intelligence module, which she has in her. Yeah. So uh, she is absolutely a whole artificial intelligence module. And if you see the film Ex Machina. Yes, great book, a film. Yeah, that's, great all film yeah. that, that's all possible. I mean, it's all possible now. You know, for all I know, you could be a robot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who can tell? I mean, you really, really, I mean, some of them are so good. You, 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 in the, on the films, you couldn't tell. And if you look at the, the real ones that are around, they're quite frightening, really frightening. But no, uh, and what Cher had done, and it won't spoil this for anybody, she had left a piece of herself in all the other workshop robots. So she was there, and then he sort of rediscovered the fact that these robots were all fairly similar to Cher. And, you know, so it was... It wasn't easy, you know, because all the parts had to be sourced. But, I mean, she was actually put back together and, you know, arrived back in one piece. And he loves her. I think he really, really loves Cher. Yeah. Um, because she, but, and she offers him everything. Oh, she's and perfect. Course, she is perfect course, and he, loyal. He, and he yeah. But sexually, he doesn't fancy her at all. <laughs> And she really gets really annoyed. There are pieces in the uh, in the book where she gets really, really upset with him. So it says, well, what's the matter with you? You know, I can do it better than anybody else. I can do it longer than anybody else. I can do anything you want. And I'm really, look, I'm beautiful. What's the matter with you? And he just really doesn't, can't make the, the connection between having sex with Murphy and then having sex with the machine. So he just backs off like every time. But she gets cross about it. Because there's part of her um, artificial intelligence which makes her want to have feelings. And she certainly, the only one she really respects is the commander because she often kicks off about the only person I'm working for is you. You know, I tolerate the rest, but, you know, I'm here for you. I'm not here for Murphy or anybody else. And she makes that, you know, as the books go on, that becomes a bit of an issue at times. So you've written, what, nearly 30 books now? Yeah, 27. 27. Yeah. How many of them have been turned into audio books? You're doing the first ones. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. this is a totally new area for you then, because this is the, the cutting edge of publishing, really, isn't it? We're in the Wild yeah, West yeah, yeah. a little bit. Everyone's yeah. trying to work yeah. it out. Um, how has the process been then for you? Because this is your work that you've put your heart and soul into and you basically have to hand it over to a stranger to yeah. voice it. How has it been for you? Well, my girlfriend thinks I'm absolutely mad in doing that. She said, you should have done it yourself. And I said, well, no, you've got to realise that you know, in this world there are other people that have better skills than you. And I said, you know, Graham, I'm happy with Graham to do it. Um, and I am, I am. And, and I've listened to what, obviously, everything you've done so far many times over. And what I have uh, come to the conclusion is an audio book gives a book a third dimension. Wow. Oh, well, thanks for that. Um... No, it, well, it, no, it does. Um, and as the author, I can sit there and listen to things. And I think that's really, really good. And I really enjoy listening to it. Um, the... The, 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 the break comes, I think, with books if they ever go into a film. Because uh, Bruce Springsteen said this a long time back. He had a, uh, a track called My Hometown. Yeah. And he said when he plays this My Hometown, everybody can think of, you know, she cl close their eyes and think of their hometown. And he said they have dreams about it, you know, their hometown. And he said it means something to every person that listens to the music. He said, and then the film people come along and they make a film. And it's not your hometown. It's somebody else's hometown. 
yeah. and it's not in your area it's somewhere you've never been to and he said you spoil a piece of that imagination it just it just goes and i think with the books uh i want i want the book that you're doing to become a film it okay. wouldn't be too it wouldn't be too difficult to do it wouldn't be too expensive to do but the issue is everybody will have a dream about what's happening well i see when i'm reading it out loud and recording it i see vivid images of what's going on vivid and i'm hoping that the listener gets that too but i know that their pictures will be different yeah well if you had to <clears throat> excuse me if i had to say what's the um the big image i have of the book it's it might surprise you uh, there's, there's a piece in the book, I'm not sure if you've got to it yet, but there's a piece there going to uh, the army garrison, the US army garrison forward base in Afghanistan, and they're marching across, I mean, it's all open ground, and they're marching across to the garrison. Now, they march pretty damn quick, yeah. because most of them are tall, very leggy, so they, they're, able to, they're able to really step it out. And then they do it. They do this for hours and hours on end. So they're, surprise, surprise, they're incredibly good at it. Now, they've all got these high up ponytails and to the right. And my image of them is the marching across this piece of land towards the US uh, forward garrison with these ponytails swinging from left to right as they march. And that's the image I, I have. Yeah, my only concern would be if it was turned into a film I, I don't know how much the author of the book uh, has to say on the characters in the film yeah because yeah. I'm so set in my mind you know it's, it, would, it would be quite I would find it quite difficult to let somebody else pick the characters but I suppose that's the way it will go yeah, because it was great for me, because when I first, when we first got together to do this, and I said, have you got any information on the characters? You sent me photographs and everything. I mean, yeah. so I was all set up, you know, you had a little bit of backstory for each one, and it was just, that kind of stuff makes it so much easier for me, and more well, enjoyable. You wouldn't, believe, you wouldn't believe how how difficult it was to pick the photographs. Yeah. Be Began was not quite the person I wanted. I couldn't get I couldn't get authorization for the photo I wanted. So Begum is a second choice. She's a little bit too pretty, okay. really. Right. But she's fine. Uh, and the one the one that was the most interesting to source, which you haven't got there yet, is we've got a girl from Mongolia in the um my my girlfriend, by the way, is Mongolian. So uh, we've got a girl from Mongolia in this uh, in the book and getting a Mongolian who fitted my image was incredibly difficult because if you go on to Shuttlestock or any of the big uh, picture suppliers, they often will tell you somebody is Mongolian when they're a Kazakh or when they're Chinese. And the difference is when you look at Mongolians, They've got incredibly high cheekbones and they're quite wide across the face. So they do look very, very different if you know what you're looking for. And of course, I've got my other half breathing down my neck saying that one's not Mongolian. She's in Kazakhstan. Why are they putting these Chinese in there? And in the end, we used her sister's daughter. You did? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. So it's actually a real person. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> wow. That's, uh, well, I'm looking forward to getting to that bit. Um, yeah, it's it, good. The, the first two books, I, I'm about, I'm about two-thirds of the way through the second one now. We should have the second one out, certainly by the end of the month. And yeah. uh, the first one is a, is a great read and an introduction to this world of this very young commander and these this very young team of girls which have all been rescued from... Oh, the, the, their backgrounds are terrible, what they've been through, but they've been rescued from that, and they just find that being in this, this troop, this platoon, means everything to them, and they become so... Bo it's, just, uh, it's just a great... And the missions they go on and the things they achieve, and then even when they go to Japan and just do demonstrations of the knife-throwing and stuff, all that's all, all in there. It, it is great. Do you, do you have a connection with Japan? Because there's, there's quite a bit of that in there, too. Well, I only have worked for Japanese banks. Okay. <laughs> I've okay. got a really good feel for Japanese culture. Yeah. 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 No, it is great. So what's next for you then? 
obviously there's the there's the t turning these the, the rest of the the series of six into audiobooks what what's next down the line for you well i've got book seven i want to finish that i would really really want to, i really think i need to stop but it's really a bit like a roller coaster because you get, yeah my subconscious suddenly kicks in and says why don't you do so and so you'll find this in the book because they end up in russia um where uh, Russia, America, Mexico, they, they go to lots and lots of different places because governments realize that they can do things really, really off the chart. And the other, the other thing, which is a bit sad in some ways, but it's a reflection of their background, they don't have any problem with killing people. Yeah, oh no, not at all. They don't have any problem <laughs> at all. Um, <laughs> and they even say to other people, well, you know, What's the scene in the second book where he says, well, oh, well, I'll probably just kill you then or something. It's just, yeah, they, they, don't, they don't take any prisoners. Well, Teller's the one. Teller is absolutely terrible because she's actually interviewed at uh, Sandhurst. And they, they say to her, you know, um, why aren't there any survivors? And Teller said, as soon as they, ta they take us on, they've signed their own death certificate. And once you're dead, you can't be a survivor. Yeah. <laughs> Which, for a 14 year old, it's very, 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 very interesting. Yeah. And the way they take them out, they, they travel light. They take them out in knives and oh, just so efficient. Um, yeah, yeah. Just just brilliant. Yeah. The books are called Cut, uh, C-U-T-T, -T, A Remarkable yeah. Story from Afghanistan. The first one is out now as an audio book. They're all out uh, as books, aren't they? But yeah, that's right. But yeah. uh, and so you can get them from Amazon and whatever. But if you want to get the audio book version, Audible, Amazon, iTunes, they're all there. Cut, C-U-T-T, -T, and A Remarkable Story from Afghanistan. Check them out. And if you'd like to download them for free, if you go to the bottom of, if you're watching this on YouTube, if this, you're watching an embedded version, then click to the actual YouTube thing. And if you go to the bottom there, there's my email address. And if you email me and just put free code in the subject, I'll, if you're one of the first 20 people to do that, I'll send you the, uh, the codes to download them for free. And you can uh, you can check them out without paying any money just because you got to the end of this oh. great chat. Yes, sorry, I'm taking money out of your hands. Look at that. I'm taking yeah. the food out of your mouth, Dr. T. <laughs> How dare I? Yeah. <laughs> but hey, great to meet you. And um, we'll have to do this when we get the uh, when we get a few more out as well. And we can talk more about the, uh, yes. the series yeah. and how it goes. Hey, You'll find they're very much like a double edged sword, though. The, these girls, they have a, a very, very kind side. And then they have a side to them which is just like the edge of the sword. Right. Well, Best I hope I hope you didn't get that from your own personality. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs>